Thank you very much, Milo. And uh, well, thank you in, in both senses. I mean, I thank you really for inviting me to, to give this talk here tonight. And uh, I also thank you, between brackets, for enrolling me to do, to do this. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Milo and the Western Australia Division of uh, GSA for this invitation. It's a real honor for me to be like, uh, talking here tonight. And uh, before I get started, I have to make some comments. Uh, first, for my colleagues and students at Curtin, this is just an invitation. Just if you expect to hear much deep, cutting-edge science here tonight, uh, I won't complain if you leave. <laughs> we, I'm, this, my talk will be about just simple geological things, such as geological mapping, structural geology, stratigraphy, something like that, and the uh, implications of the knowledge we get from those basic geological topics to help exploration, mineral exploration, in this particular province. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to apologize but just be, oh, on the crime I, I am about to commit with the English language. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I cannot do it better. So I will start. Well, may, maybe most of you have heard about the Iberian Pirate Belt. This is uh, one of the major uh, massive sulfide provinces on Earth, mainly considered, uh, mainly those related to volcanic uh, environment and then I will just in the, uh, introduce the province just by giving you some uh, small hints of the main features. And, uh, it is located in, southwest, in the southwestern Iberian Peninsula within the so-called South Portuguese Zone which we have learned in the, after many years of studies there that uh, it's represents an exotic fragment of Laurasia accreted to mainland Gondwana, which makes most of the Iberian surface. A, this is a, a, a very important metallogenic province and it contains more than 80 base metal sulfide deposits, more than 200 iron oxide, oxide hydroxide deposits, and they, all these deposits, there are associated to a, a Mississippian a bimodal volcano sedimentary complex. Therefore, the interpretation of these deposits as VHMS, uh, volcanic hosted masses sulfides. I don't like, uh, just to start, I don't like the word massive sulfides because most of the deposits, even though they contain uh, massive sulfides consist of stockwork, stringer ore. So it's, I prefer to use the term uh, volcanic ma uh, hosted sulfides. And then this is just advancing one of the conclusions of, uh, of the talk is that vol both volcanism and mineralization predate the onset of collision, of continental collision be between Gondwana and Russia in this part of the origin. So, just for comparison with other uh, volcanic hosted uh, sulfide provinces on Earth, just in here are depicted the three main ones. I mean, the one, the pirate belt, this is the largest by far. And second in volume of mineralization is the so-called Abitibi province, in, well, the Abitibi belt in the Superior province in Canada. This is Archaea, and this is Mississippi, and as I said, and the third in number of showings and uh, volume of mineralization is the Mount Reed uh, volcanics or deposits in Tasmania, which happen to be Cambrian, more or less. If we compare the total amount of ore Estimated. This, I must say, this is old-fashioned and, and, and this is outdated for sure. But you can see the difference. This is the Iberian Parabell, by far 
much larger metal contents than the other two provinces together. So with the various elements involved, interesting mine, gold, uh, silver, and the base metals, it's the same. But everything, uh, everybody will believe this is good news. It was, it would be good news if the, the grade in the most deposits was high, but this is not the case, as we'll see later on. Okay, this is just to show you the uh, a geological map of the Iberian Pirate Belt in uh, the Spanish part of the province. It's the province extends from, occupies the southwesternmost tip of Spain and the southern tip of uh, Portugal. This is only the Spanish part of it. You can see every dot or every circle here is a deposit, quite a few. Those with the mine symbol and uh, white are world class. This has been more than 25 million tons. Those in black are giant, that's to say more than 100 million tons. In fact, this is just Again, a very old uh, a compilation of the mines and uh, comparing their metal contents. So all, all these guys here, they all are larger than 100 million tons. These are the ones so-called world class. Important to mention, this guy here, this is the Rio Tinto deposit, or deposits, I should say, which alone add for something like 700 million tons, just in a single deposit. So this is not a like common uh, volcanic masses sulfides, but this is, these tonnages are more typical of sedimentary environments. But well, in here, that's the case. Okay, let's go a, a bit further. Now I'm going to make a telescopic approach to the geological context of the metallogenic province. And I will start by looking from the space station somewhere. And, and uh, I will concentrate. This is a very nice cartoon drawn by Damien Nance, uh, co-workers, a few years ago to account for the formation, for the amalgamation, final amalgamation of Pangaea. And uh, while well, the record of this is the amalgamation of Pangaea resulted from the collision of a northern continent, or Russia, as you know, with Gondwana, a southern continent, and the future, well, if you want to call it at this distance, that's the future zone, is the, so, the broad Wachita, Alleghenian, or Appalachian, Bariscan belt across it. We are located right in this corner in the uh, in the easternmost east, end of this graph orogenic, or broad orogenic system, just right at the middle of Pangaea. Just focusing a little bit to, at the regional scale, we are within the so-called European Bariscan Belt or Orogen, which is very, very nicely shown in this cartoon. Uh, it, it has two main elements, structural elements. Oh, sorry. A, that happened to be this huge arc or orocline or whatever you want to call it. I prefer the word arc for this, the so-called Ibero-Armorican arc. And another one, smaller inside but tighter, at the easternmost end of the belt in the Bohemian Massif. Uh, this brownish color here to the north, this is Russia. All these, the other colors south of this line I'm drawing right here, that's the future zone, that's the future zone, that's the future zone. Everything inside, this is Gondwana, this is Russia. The Iberian Pirate Belt, as I said before, occurred in southwestern most Iberia, right here, south of the Sirtia zone between the two main continents in the South Portuguese zone. So let's focus a, li a little bit 
closer and we'll get to the local setting that's the southern part of the southwest Siberia that is can origin in which in gray here you have this is the present day orientation this is uh, the, what we used to call Iberian Autochthon, that's the margin of Gondwana. This guy here, this brown color here, is a belt of Ophiolites. And all this brown color and light brown here is, again, an oceanic derived unit that has been interpreted as an accretionary prism. And so this is the South Portuguese terrain proper, or, or so. The boundary is this line here. This is marking, in fact, the suture between the oceanic units thrust on top of the South Portuguese zone. In the South Portuguese zone, there are three main divisions, structural and stratigraphic divisions. The northernmost one bounded by this thrust here and by this upper thrust in the, in the roof is the parite belt. That's the parite belt domain, that's the one where all the uh, all deposits uh, occur. This intermediate unit is uh, it's a uh, flesh, cenorogenic flesh developed uh, as a response of the collision between Gondwana and this block here. So it's uh, something that uh, overstepping is overstepping the pre-existence stratigraphy. And this unit here, so-called Southwest Portugal domain, is very nice. It's uh, we have the same flesh, but in some antiforms, for instance here, uh, we have a time equivalent uh, sequence to the ones making the parrot belt, but in this case, we have no volcanic rocks. It's just a platform of carbonate, mixed car carbonate and silicic plastic platform. We'll see that a little later. Okay, what's the present day structure? Well, wow. these are interpretations based on these two guys on a uh, very old uh, refraction seismic profile shot and by people at the ETH in Zurich many years ago. And while well, everybody agrees that, well, that's, that should, should, should be in here, this is a Gondwana, this is the pool of the lower zone, that's the accretion prism, and now this guy here is the pilot belt. It's the same in here, the, the accretion prism, the Ophiolite, the Gondwana, and in the lower plate, the South Portuguese zone, which shows a very nice imbricate fan geometry. I mean, that's a typical fall unfold and thrust belt developed as a consequence of collision between the two plates. This is beautifully imaged by a seismic reflection profile shot uh, in the early 2000, where you can see, well, the suture in this case is located somewhere in here. So this, uh, this is a longer than the pirate belt proper. But if you look just south of the, pirate, of the suture zone, you'll see this beautiful uh, imbricate fan developed atop a mid crust of detachment around there. This is image here. Okay, so we are, the present day structure corresponds to a fold and thrust belt developed as a consequence of collision. If you focus a bit closer, then you go to the field and draw some uh, cross sections. In fact, we did that uh, uh, in the early 90s. These three sections, oh, I'm sorry, uh, were uh, done by myself. And, uh, and you can see that also at this scale, you can see four kilometers, four kilometers, two kilometers. So it's a very complicated, imbricate fan involving duplexing, anticlinal stack formation, some out of sequence thrusting. So it's a very complicated thing from a structural point of view. Now, let's focus a little bit closer to the deposit. So I, I will show the present day interpretive structure of several classical deposits in the parallel belt. 
touch is mine. I, I won't pay any attention to the details of these maps, of these sections, but just notice that all of them are just duplex, duplex structures. So indicated, internally indicated. That's uh, at Filono Artasis, one of the Tarsis uh, deposits. Well, just for you to know, and that's the reason why I don't like the word masses of fights. Masses of fights are these guys in yellow, whereas all this bluish color here, it's a stonework ore, which is intimately imbricated in dup forming duplex with the massive ore. So you cannot separate one thing from the other. It's the same at Sotiel Migoyas, it's a, it's a less detailed section. At Neves Colo, for instance, that's the, one of the latest findings in the province, is one of the best studied because of the special characteristics of the mineralization here. And again, many of these contacts you see in here is just folded, thru folded thrusts. The same at Anankoyar, the same at Aguastinidas. This is again, this is again a, a brand new deposit was just discovered. There was a Western Aguastinidas deposit exploded in the, at the end of the 20th century, but it was found in the, in the late, oh no, probably in the 90s, yeah. And another brand new deposit, this is the same Sotiel Migoyas that we saw in a previous example, but this is a Massa Valverde deposit, a completely hidden deposit. This is 700, 700 meters at depth below the overlying flesh. It was discovered by various methods, and uh, well, this is just to show, just as a section, again, the indicate fan structure, the deposits imbricated in them, and these are just close-up views of parts of these three different sections across this deposit here, where you can see also imbrication between stowwork and massive ore. Several horses. But let's focus even more. This is at the output scale, and you can see very nicely there that's a massive sulfide, and this is the shear zone separating it from, well, in fact, the, the detail here and the contrast in the light with the light is not that good. But this is the stalwart thrust on top of the massive sulfides. Uh, it's the same in here. In here you have one of those massive sulfides. You can see a close-up view in here. That's the contact. All this guy here is this package here. That's a shear zone, a major shear zone, bringing this is to work on top of this and, and training, incorporating <coughs> several sigmoidal shaped blocks from the mass underlying mass of sulfide. So, again, the same. Now, these are details, sheet folds and things like that, ramp and flat geometry. This is an internal thrust at La Zarza mine between two. Uh, layers of, of two horses of stowwork. All these darker color here are the stowwork veinlets. And this is a, a thrust of the stowwork on top of massive sulfides. So I am showing this kind of relationship because one should expect just the opposite. I mean, the stowwork, the field stowwork being located under, beneath the massive sulfides. But uh, very frequently you see just the opposite relationship. And this is not primary, of course. This is due to tectonics. If we go even deeper, at the closest view, you can see, well, all these guys here are just shots of shear zones developed within the massive sulfides themselves. And you can see this immoidal shape class made of pyrite trapped by blastomyelonites formed by the more uh, base metal rich things, uh, copper and zinc and zinc uh, sulfides in all these guys. That's the end of another. That's uh, the pressure shadow right at the corner of one of those sigmoidal shaped class. Very nice myelonitic things. In here you have a pyrite class that is, I hope you can see very dark lines coming from the base to the top, defining 
a very nice duplex at this scale. This is one millimeter, I mean the scale is in here. And very funny, I will come back later on to this. Eventually you might see in here that is a nice fold developed on pyrite, which is very striking, and we'll comment later on on that. These are just shots from the stonework and very significant uh, asymmetric tails on, on, on pyrite class and so a, and delta class and so on, documenting the shear component in the deformation. Yes, that's it. So let's go on. Now we forget for a, for a while this structure. Now we are coming back to a, another basic pillar of geology, that is stratigraphy. As I mentioned before, the South Portuguese zone contains, includes three main structural divisions and stratigraphic divisions, the pirate belt in the north, the bichal intrusion of fleece domain in the middle, and the South Portuguese domain in the south. As I mentioned before, VSC in here represents a volcanic sedimentary complex to which the mineralization is associated in some way. Comb is the flesh on top of that. And as I said before, time equivalent to all these guys in the southwest Portugal domain, all we have is just platform sedimentation, shallow water in fact, carbonate and, uh, and silicy plastic. So somewhere beneath this guy beneath this belt, the actual boundary between the area subjected to deformation and emplacement of the volcanic sedimentary complex, and this area that didn't see any of, of that, must lie somewhere in between. This is, has been searched for and found with uh, geophysics and so on. It's more or less right at the middle of the outcrop of the flesh. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, well, let me go back a minute. Within the parrot bell we distinguish various units, central, uh, western, central, and eastern blocks. This refers only to Spanish side, separated by the uh, northwest or uh, trending or northeast trending faults, oblique to the main grain you may have realized in the previous shot that is uh, east-west. And uh, within them, we distinguish the south as uh, an intermediate and the northern domain. So in this area here, in the eastern block, very little representation of the volcanic sedimentary complex exists, and so this is, so far we are working very much on these guys, which happen to be sedimentary and don't know the relationship to this. So this is pending further research. Now, if we go into some more detail in the stratigraphy, I'm referring now to the western blocks and the central block in Spain, the one with a well-developed uh, volcanic sedimentary complex. We can see how the, this brown color here at the base, that's the underlying the pre-volcanic sedimentary complex sedimentary succession that I, forget, I forgot to mention before is just a epicontinental epi sea deposits, shallow water thing. It's called the phyllite quartzite group. It's just quartz, uh, sandstones and shales. And all these colors in here belong to the volcanic sedimentary complexes. I, don't go, I won't go into any detail. But this, this black layer used as a datum here is a very prominent uh, marker bed in the entire pirate belt. It's so-called purple shale horizon. It's uh, barely a few meters thick. But it happens to be a blanket everywhere on top of the volcano sedimentary complexes. Before I forget to mention, all the mineralizations happen between these boundaries, this boundary and this upper boundary, so within this part. 
Volcanism continues at some stage after, but that no mineralization is associated to this. Okay. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, if you realize these are these uh, stratigraphic sections are drawn at scale, you might realize there are significant uh, thickness changes. Significant thickness changes which uh, have served us, to, served us uh, to interpret that uh, host and graving student was developing coeval to the position of the volcanic sedimentary complex. And in fact, uh, we identified three main divisions, the ones shown in the previous slide. This is, oh, sorry. Um, Intermediate domain, uh, this is, uh, can read, this is northern domain, southern, or southern domain, northern domain. The same in the central block. You can see the intermediate domain is always very uh, little thickness of the volcanic sedimentary complex, and another very peculiar feature. Most of the first component of this volcanic sedimentary complex in the intermediate unit correspond to subaerial explosion, uh, uh, volcanic rocks. So it's mainly ignimbrites. It's just a pile of ignimbrites and ignimbrites. So this, uh, this was the main base for us to propose that this intermediate domain here represented the broad host eventually forming islands at the seafloor whereas the southern domain and the northern domain would represent a, a, a deep, a clear marine environment where volcanism was taking place. Another interesting feature on the stratigraphy here in the southern domain is that we have a, a, the, the sedimentary component a, in the volcanic sedimentary complex contain, include also a, some mature quartz, uh, silicyclastic rocks, quartzites or quartz arenites, which uh, most likely derive from the a continental source of from coastal areas. No one of those uh, quartzites are found north of this boundary, uh, of this intermediate belt here. In here, all the sedimentary component is just mud, black mud, and some eventual uh, epiclastic things, or uh, which uh, I personally interpret as distal, in bright tufts deposited, well, distributed. They occur also in here, so, and so in this intermediate ball here. Okay, now let's see what. What was the stratigraphic location of the other deposits? This is again from an old paper, but it's uh, good enough uh, to show that many people have, have been claiming, mainly in, since uh, uranium lead dating started to be produced, that most ore form in a, or all the ore form in a single mineralization stage, but this clearly shows this is real. Uh, stratigraphic section uh, in the areas of various deposits. In places you have just one layer, but in many others you have two at different stratigraphic <coughs> locations. So there are several episodes then of uh, general age. General age. This is the purple. I don't know if you can see the purple color here. It's very faint. I'm afraid. This is the purple shale horizon just blanketing the entire province. This is, we have very nice uh, absolute ages now from volcanic intervary with it at 340. And the oldest so far volcanic, uh, uh, so far dated volcanic rock is something like 557 or something like that. So it's Lower part, Estonesian Elevisean. That's a, that's the bracket we have. So.
So in between, if you will, five, 560 and 500, and 540. That's uh, the. Three, 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 oh, sorry, 360. I'm I used to work with the Cadomian belt, and in there is five. The mm -hmm. same number, but 500. But so this is. The number, the range? The, the range is in between 360 and 340. 360 and 340. Yeah, that's the range. Yeah, that's the range for the volcanic rocks uh, in the volcanic sedimentary complex. Sorry? 35 minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll go. Oh. This is uh, just a model just to account that the, uh, for the uh, um, enormous amount of metal delivered to the, to the sea floor. Uh, this guy, Marcou, and some other co-workers uh, from Bergem uh, proposed that uh, the whole upper crust must be involved, must have been involved in uh, hydrothermal convection, allowing for the uh, allowing the just to dissolution and precipitation upwards uh, along these faults here, and. Uh, the, the, it happens that the, most of the faults have been used by both by the volcanism and by the hydro, for the hydrothermal discharge. Okay, let's go a bit faster. That's just a classical example. I, I'm only, I will put only the emphasis in showing the feeder store work beneath a massive sulfide form at the sea floor and the uh, minerals uh, alteration associated to it. An inner, a proximal, chloride rich alteration halo and the distal sericide rich alteration halo. This is important for, for the next slides. Well, these are just examples of the stock work. In, uh, well, this particular one is taken in Rio Tinto. And uh, this is an, in a oxidized part of the one of the rock, of the deposits. Which type of mineralization do we have? Do, do we have in the pirate belt? Well, most of it corresponds to the brine pool type. They are associated to black shales in most cases. Uh, they all also occur associated to volcanic rocks, but they are generally interleaved with black shales. So we favor this kind of deposit. And in fact, Mike Solomon and myself many years ago posed the, the weird idea that this kind of deposits forming roughly collisional environments, whereas this kind of, uh, let's say, the black smoke type mounts, uh, typical of Kuroko deposits in Japan and so on, forms in backyard environments or eventually in the mid ocean or near mid ocean reaches. I mentioned before the alteration halos, and uh, this is uh, one of the main tools to, for exploration. You may not see, this is Rio Tinto mine again, the Corta Atalaya open pit. This is the massive sulfide body. All this area is stored, all this area is stored too. But this in here we have the internal part, so it's a chloritic part. This is the external halo, rich in sericide. People will say, well, first of all, well, deep is towards the end of the room. This means that this is on top of this, this is on top of this, which in turn is on top of this. In fact, you are looking at very nice duplex structure. All the contacts here are faults, and this particular one here is one of the transfer faults linking this, uh, this part here to this part here. Again, just imbrication. Another kind of alteration uh, that's very useful for exploration is for sure the epigenetic evidence for oxidation of the deposits, the formation of glossons. This is a, oh, sorry. This is a very typical example. Of, uh, I think it's a Peña del Hierro mine. You can see how alteration progressed along fault planes and so on. Again, very useful tool for exploration. Now, what is the space relationship of all deposits and regional faults? 
Well, this is again is just a map showing the faults. I, I, I guess the people in the end of the room will not see the various colors showing the various orientations, but just all this, the main grain, that east-west thing, correspond to thrust. The other are just nowadays lateral ramps to them. So they have, if you see the frequency of deposits in relation to the distance to the regional scale faults, you'll see that the vast majority of them are at less than 200 meters from major faults. Uh, this is not just by chance. And if you look at the orientation and the type of fault we're dealing with, the vast majority are as close to the thrust, the east-west thrust. Again, we are interpreting the stratigraphic evidence suggested that we were at the time of emplacement of the volcanic complex. Uh, we had extensional uh, tectonics, Holst and Graven things forming. Now we see that the deposits, which we believe just were formed along those very same faults, now occur close to the thrust. So we are here in presence of a typical example of inversion tectonics. A former extensional structure is inverted to a compressional system. Okay, next. So I'm just about to conclude. It's just, again, I don't know if you can read anything. I can barely read from here even. Well, the main characteristic of the sulfites, mainly the massive sulfites, they are they have very low base metal contents relative to other provinces, with small exceptions in the northern, in the northern part, a northern belt with mainly consisting of medium sized to small deposits, which happen to have, to have much higher grades, and the Neverscobo deposit, which is unique because of the very important uh, thing over there. Mm. They are, the deposits are commonly associated to black shales. Some of them are also associated to fossil volcanics, but none of them to the mafic volcanics present in the, in the sequence. Some deposits predate even the eruption, the first eruption recorded in the, in the sub-basin where they fall. So that test, testify for the coeval nature of hydrothermal discharge and volcanism. In places, volcanism predates the uh, metal deposition. In other places, it's just the other way around. All the deposits are in, structurally imbricated at various scale, both internally with the stowware and even with the host rocks. I can read. Well, the, as a consequence of this, a significant aspect, aspect ratio change took place in many deposits, mainly by thickening due to the formation of duplexes. So everything, all the deformation at the present days of exposure occur at, under green sheets, fascist conditions. There is no obvious mineralogical or geochemical zoning in, in the deposits. This is something uh, we don't know whether it is a primary feature or it is imposed by tectonics. But we realize that base metal gray increase, increases uh, significantly uh, in, in the shear zone bounding the, the imbricates. We don't know whether the shear zones localized in there because uh, they were focused for by the more ductile base metal sulfides or if it is just the effect of tectonic remobilization of the more literal sulfides, I don't know. Uh, base metal sulfides show all of them, uh, blastomyelonitic textures, whereas pyrite generally behaves uh, brittly, but locally, and, and as I showed you to you before, some stage, I don't know where, yeah, here you can see a very nice fall, some place, in, in some places it's behaved uh, just uh, ductilely. 
Okay, I'm, I'm about to finish. I will finish this. I, will, I won't recapitulate. I will go to the conclusions of, of my talk. That uh, the aim of the talk was just to show which basic geological uh, information uh, can be useful for exploration. And uh, now, I mean, no way to find uh, new deposits uh, at surface. All the findings in the last 30 years, have all, of, all of them are blind deposits at depth. So, but we have to pay attention to this. Geophysics, geochemical exploration, all of them have been very successfully applied, but this is not enough. In fact, many boreholes have been drilled in uh, geochemical or geophysical anomalies in their own place simply because no structural or no geological studies have been undertaken before. So this is just an orientation for the explorers. Concerning the stratigraphy, we must acknowledge that most all deposits occur within or immediately predating the volcano sedimentary complex. So when the, this guy is exposed, that's the way to, that's the way we should look at. If it is not exposed, then we should look for it at that some other means. And they are frequently associated with black shells. That can be also a, a good guide, even for geophysics, because these guys are very nice conductors. And the structure. Concerning structure, a structural mapping, I, I hope that after my talk, everybody will, would have become aware that structural mapping is a first of the requirement in, in this province. If you don't perform these kind of studies, uh, you barely will find anything. There is another indication is that all these or most all deposits studied so far occur within or close to shear zones of, of fault zones. Another guide to, for exploration. This is, I, I didn't mention that, but this is obvious, an obvious consequence. Whenever you find post deformation mineralized hydrothermal veins in the surface, there is a chance that something underneath might, might, be, might, might occur. And concerning the alteration, it's already said. I mean, when, if you happen to see a gosan in the surface, uh, that's a good, good news, but this, I, I think that all of this has been already seen. <coughs> and then mapping the distal or proximal alteration halos can be also of great help. I think that's all I wanted to tell. Thank you very much. This is a very... <laughs>